In 1995, members of the Japanese cult Am Shinrikyo released sarin nerve gas into a Japanese subway, killing 11 people and injuring 5,000. Destroying the World to Save It is Robert Lifton's book about the apocalyptic cult, its founder, and its members. He spoke at Olson's Books in Washington, D.C. for about an hour. Then it'll be your turn. I've got a copy of the book here as well. If you want to refer to it. Well, good evening and welcome to Books and Olson's Books and Records. Uh, tonight we have with us Robert J. Lifton. Dr. Lifton is a uh, distinguished professor of psychiatry and psychology at the City University of New York, as well as director of the Center on Violence and Human Survival at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He is an active member of the Physicians for Social Responsibility and a founding member of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. He has written numerous books, among which are The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide, and Death and Life, a study of the uh, effects of the atomic bomb on its survivors in Hiroshima, for which he has won the National Book Award. Uh, his latest book is Destroying the World in Order to Save It, Om Shinrinko, uh, Ap Apocalyptic Violence and the New Global Terrorism, Terrorism, which focuses on the Japanese group which, in 1995, released a deadly gas in the Tokyo subway system, killing 11 people. This book is a really quite powerful study of the Millennium Cults, and it's been described as a path-breaking study of the inner life of a modern Millennial Cult. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Lipp. Thanks very much. You can tell from that introduction that many of my subjects have not been among the most cheerful, uh, and sometimes a person like me gets a little sensitive about walking into a room because one senses that people are asking what new horror will he bring us now? <laughs> so uh, I suggest that you invite me back next year and I'll talk about human virtue, loving kindness, and sexual pleasure. But tonight I'm going to talk about apocalyptic violence. Uh, what do we mean by apocalyptic violence? Well, it can be violence on a large scale, but what makes it apocalyptic is its association with the idea of destroying the world, of the end of the world in some way, in the service of renewal, in the service of a beautiful new world that will ostensibly follow. If one looks at this kind of violence, one can associate it with various acts by radical fundamentalist groups in the Middle East, whether Israeli or Arab, uh, various cults in the Europe and the United States, uh, such as People's Temple or Solar Temple or many others, and with certain forms of American right-wing violence, uh, even Timothy McVeigh, as I'll come back and say something about uh, at the end of my remarks. In other words, apocalyptic violence is very widespread, and one can extend that idea to some of the dreadful genocides that we've seen in recent years, including those in Cambodia, R Rwanda, and Yugoslavia. With this extension of apocalyptic violence, one can see something of a worldwide epidemic of it, and one can all too readily agree with the distinguished historian Eric Hobsbawm, who says, the old century has not ended well. Now, my own approach to studies of this kind is to try to combine psychology and history. What we call a psychohistorical study really means using a psychological method to study a historical problem. And I've done that in relation to a number of issues, some of which were mentioned in the introduction, uh, and these have bearing on, on what happened with Om Shinrikyo. I've interviewed people who were submitted to Chinese thought reform. Uh, this is in the mid and late 50s, so-called brainwashing. I've interviewed Hiroshima survivors in the 60s. I've interviewed Vietnam veterans, especially anti-war veterans uh, in the early 70s, and Nazi doctors uh, in the late 70s. And all of these uh, groups have some bearing on Om Shinrikyo, whether it has to do with mind manipulation, with killing in the name of healing, or with destroying in order to save, uh, as was often put forward in connection with Vietnam. 
I similarly went about this study of Om Shinrikyo by interviewing 10 former members intensely over many hours uh, during five trips to Japan from 1995 through 1997. And at the same time, I try to familiarize myself with everything I could about them through work of others, through journalists, through Japanese scholars whom I talked to and read. And in that way, I came to a series of shared themes which I'll be talking about uh, right now. I understand, as many of you do, that there's uh, a controversy about the terminology here. Uh, some people say with some justification that to use the term cult is pejorative, and I do use it, and it is pejorative, but one can also use the term new religion, which is more neutral. In that sense, I restrict the term cult to groups that show certain characteristics, which are totalistic or thought reform-like practices, that is, practices of mind manipulation, which show a shift from general spiritual principles to worship of a particular leader, a particular guru, and which tend to demonstrate a combination of spiritual quest from below, ordinary people seeking some spiritual meaning in their life, but being exploited from above, sexual and economic exploitation from above. I want to take you on a brief cultic journey, which can include at least uh, something about what Om Shinrikyo did, the emergence of the guru and his significance, uh, the experiences of a particular disciple, very briefly, and some of the relationship between what I call megalomania and weaponry, uh, which will become clearer later on, and then finally, some of the general characteristics of this kind of dangerous, destructive, violent cult and its relationship to patterns in our own society. Because my conviction throughout the work is that by exploring the bizarre emotions and actions of Om Shinrikyo, we better understand closely related impulses in our own country, dangerous tendencies in American society that we need to combat. What Om Shinrikyo did, very briefly, uh, was to burst on the world scene on March 20th, 1995, through a sarin gas attack in the to Tokyo subways and five different trains where 12 people were killed and about 5,000 in some way injured. Um, there were also terrorist actions after that, which I won't go into in detail as they tried to avoid arrest. But in addition to that, they stockpiled both biological and chemical weapons and made inquiries about nuclear weapons and they had a plan for uh, an infinitely larger release of sarin gas in Tokyo later in November which according to the vision of Asahara the guru would initiate World War III by bringing in Japan and the United States in various ways which would in turn bring about a biblical Armageddon. As wild as this kind of scheme was, it was acted upon and only interrupted by the arrest of the group that perpetrated the March 20th uh, release of Sarin. There are a couple of very important questions here which are crucial throughout this work. Um, how did Om Shinrikyo come to cross a crucial threshold from merely anticipating Armageddon, as many groups do, to taking active steps toward bringing it about, and taking active steps by seeking to acquire the kind of weaponry that could, in some way, uh, produce something like a world-ending event. To say something first, very briefly, about the guru and his myth, um, you know, a guru bursts upon the scene by some often uh, dramatic action, and then we retrospectively try to understand how he or she came to be that charismatic person. There's much that one could say, but uh, I think I would summarize it by saying that we want to know as much about the childhood of any guru, but that childhood doesn't explain fully his or her adult behavior or emergence as a guru. Uh, in the case of the guru of Om Shinrikyo, one could say, as with all gurus, he may or she may be everything or nothing. 
everything in that the guru creates the cult and runs the cult and has his ideas dominant but nothing because a guru is not a guru without disciples and without disciples a guru doesn't exist the guru narrative is elusive but from studies of trends in a guru one can say that the guru has had some kind of intense experience a spiritual insight which has transformed his life and conveys a sense that he knows or she knows has some kind of absolute knowledge I would say that what we call charisma which usually means some irresistible kind of attraction for people really in psychological terms consists of a sense that a guru can convey to people uh, of vitality and meaning in their lives in an immediate and all-powerful way on the one hand and of immortality, a sense of being part of something eternal on the other. In the case of Asahara, there's a certain amount of knowledge about his childhood. Uh, he's, he came from an impoverished family in rural Kyushu, the Japanese uh, southern island. Uh, without going into detail, he attended a school for the blind uh, for most of his childhood and was resentful of that had partial vision in one eye, but because an older brother was completely blind, was sent there as, a, as an economic convenience by his family, uh, uh, resulting in a form of resentment which was never overcome. Uh, during his childhood, he was stronger than most other students and had the advantage of partial sight, so could be dominant, manipulative, bullying, and sometimes even violent. Um, he was rejected, however, in attempts to become a class leader, and he accused some of his teachers of speaking badly about him, but they said no, other students were a bit afraid of him. So one can say that he had certain tendencies from childhood, including alienation and resentment or resentment towards society, perhaps some paranoia and a habit of violence, and also an interest in drama and performance. But none of this, as I said before, fully explains what he did later on. The guru steps into the myth of the hero, but it's a hero on moral terms. And the guru has to follow that myth, which means a call to greatness and an undergoing ordeals, which he overcomes in order to become, in this case, a spiritual leader. And Asahara had ambitions that were quite secular. He once said, he, or more than once said, that he wanted to be Prime Minister of Japan and that he also wanted to be a great physician. But uh, he did fail his examinations as he told the story for Tokyo University after going to a cram school, a very frequent process in Japan, uh, then went into uh, a kind of herbal medicine business later on, had some conflicts with the law once in relation to violence, and then later on at the age of 27 for selling fake Chinese medicines. In all this, as he has constructed his myth, he said that he reached a point where he wondered whether he could go on, where he knew that his life had to change. He began groping, as he put it, for an answer. And he tried out various religions, including a very well-known new religion called Agonchu, where he found the model of a guru in an outstanding religious leader named Kiriyama, from whom he learned a great deal, and also took many of his ideas about uh, Tibetan Buddhism and about New Age influences, which he also brought eventually to Om Shinrikyo. But uh, a guru must have visions, and he had two predominant visions. Uh, the first which he had in 1985 at the age of 30, which involved the great Hindu god Shiva, or Shiva as he sometimes called, in which he, Asahar, was called upon uh, the god of light, as the god of light who leads the armies of the gods against the forces of darkness. And that was the vision around which he formed Om Shinrikyo. Uh, and then there was a second vision later on, which the following year in the Himalayas, where he wandered, and which he claimed to experience what he called final enlightenment. And one of the uh, spiritual teachers he had been in contact with expressed surprise about this because he thought it took a lifetime rather than a few days to experience final enlightenment. And you can never quite prove or disprove the experience of enlightenment since it is uh, so personal to oneself. 
But here one can say that one has to have this kind of conviction of enlightenment, of spiritual attainment, in order to be convincing as a guru. And in his case, as in the case of many gurus, that conviction can be combined with a kind of con man quality and self-promoting talent. Uh, to give you just the sense briefly of one of the people I interviewed, uh, whom I call the gentle Armageddonist, uh, he had been drawn to Ohm precisely because of its focus on the end of the world, on catastrophe. And in Japan, as some of you may know, the whole set of writings of Nostradamus predicting the end of the world in the year 2000, uh, ha this has been enormously prominent, and they've probably sold uh, more editions in Japan than anywhere else in the world in Japanese translation. And the General Armageddon, as I call, call him, was drawn to Ohm largely because of this uh, focus on catastrophe on the end of the world. He told me of two visions that he had, which I'll summarize, and all of the Om uh, disciples undergo various forms of meditation and intense breathing exercises with a kind of deoxygenation, which lead to what they call mystical experiences, which are very powerful, very meaningful for them, and which they attribute to the uh, beneficent influence of the guru. And he indeed had those. He had, in addition, two special visions. One was that of going through, actually going through reincarnation with the help of the guru. And in this vision, there's a kind of triangle, a pyramid, with Asahara, the guru, at the top and disciples at the bottom. And the disciples are drawn irresistibly toward Asahara at the top until they merge with him. And this is what one was supposed to do in Om to merge with the guru, become a clone of the guru. And he says that as he reaches toward Asahara, he also becomes Asahara, who asks, is this what is called nothingness? Then he, also myself, as he has merged with Asahara, answered, yes, you're experiencing this for the first time, aren't you? So it's a vision of totally merging with the guru. And then a second vision of a kind that was also quite frequent among people I interviewed, in which he is meditating calmly with fellow disciples as great fires are burning all around and the world is more or less going up in smoke. It's a kind of vision of surviving uh, a mixture of nuclear holocaust and biblical Armageddon. In all this, the extremity of the guruism can't be overestimated. This absolute cloning that is uh, demanded uh, is almost achieved so that the guru can be on the one hand spiritually talented as he was he was a great teacher of yoga and really could inspire people with his version of buddhism and could be innovative and at the same time could be exploitative duplicitous grandiose schizoid and paranoid all those things together in the same self the individual human self is complicated and can include many contradictory elements. One learns that very much in this kind of study. There was a sequence of killing in Om Shinrikyo. Uh, the first death occurred in late 1988 and was a product of extremely intense practice, which was really, one could say it's accidental, but it really resulted from uh, a brutal kind of practice which resulted in death and was both uh, intense and punitive. And then in covering up that death, there were further killings and in the uh, holding back of defectors so that over time there were as many as 80 individual killings in Om Shinrikyo which resulted from this totalistic environment that was created along with a kind of attack guruism and action prophecy. The action prophecy helped expand, <clears throat> expand the individual killing into the larger scale effort to destroy the world. And that was achieved through a process that was known in ancient Jewish writings as forcing the end. What that meant very simply was that you were impatient for the Messiah to come and you couldn't wait for God's time so you took active actions of a destructive kind to hurry up the coming of the Messiah who would set things right. But it became 
uh, heretical because the final decision, the decision on the part of uh, the rabbis in this case, was that God should bring about whatever end of the world there is to be in his own good time. Forcing the end became combined with a concept of poa. Uh, poa, either P-O-A or P-H-O-A, um, in its traditional Buddhist expression means a kind of spiritual exercise in which there is a transference of the spirit of the dying person into a higher realm. It's a spiritual exercise one is to undergo when dying, often with the help of a guru. But as it was uh, distorted in Om Shinrikyo by Asahara, the guru or others of high spiritual attainment would actually kill someone, and this would be an altruistic act because they would enhance that victim's uh, new reincarnation and aid his immortality, and I call this a kind of claim for altruistic murder. I mentioned megalomania at the beginning. Let me just say here that a guru can function at a fairly high level, that is, uh, can carry through this sort of leadership, however wildly uh, exploitative it is or destructive it is, and be both paranoid and megalomanic. A paranoid guru expects attacks and sees the world as hostile and is always fighting back. A megalomanic guru has a sense of self that replaces the world. He experiences the world only through his sense of self, and the world doesn't exist for him outside of his sense of self. And what happened with Om Shinrikyo was a combination of megalomania and ultimate weaponry, and a more dangerous combination could not be imagined. Om Shinrikyo and Asahara in particular became involved with sarin gas and also with biological weapons, as I've stated, it was partly because they had much less success in acquiring nuclear weapons, which are much harder to acquire or to stockpile. But uh, there was also a sense that these relatively lesser weapons, uh, chemical and biological weapons, were a kind of substitute for nuclear weapons, what have been called throughout the world the poor man's nuclear weapons, or what Asahara himself called energy-saving nuclear weapons. But they became very involved with uh, sarin gas, had nicknames for it, called it their magic, and it became their logo and their agent of carrying through their Armageddon plans. Behind all that, though, was the guru's attraction to nuclear weapons, or what I call in earlier work, nuclearism, an embrace of the weapons so that they become almost like deities, and Asahara indicated this by his preoccupation with the weapons. He had various visions of traveling on the astral plane, and in one of them, arriving in a place where everybody seemed to be wounded and scarred and in terrible condition, and he discovered in that vision this was Hiroshima and World War III had begun. Hiroshima was bound up with World War III as well as with the, pa the recent past in Japan so that he predicted many Hiroshima's for Japan, uh, talked of gathering some form of nuclear weapons, uh, and envisioned World War III as an overwhelming nuclear holocaust. And the overall point to be made here is that the very existence of nuclear weapons in particular in our world is profoundly dangerous because they are a lure an attraction to megalomanic individuals like Asahara, and he's not the only one, a megalomanic guru or a megalomanic person in general can be given the feeling through the existence of nuclear weapons that I alone or I with a few disciples can destroy the world, which is a kind of ultimate megalomanic uh, impulse. And that's one reason, incidentally, why uh, the scandalous rejection of the test ban treaty just in the last week or so uh, is so dangerous and helps create and further this 
lure of nuclear weapons. One can speak of a kind of crossing of the threshold, and I found this in various other studies of genocide, uh, which is brought about by certain characteristics in a world-threatening cult like Om Shinrikyo. And you've heard most of them. I'll just run them down to give you an overall sense of them. The first characteristic is this absolute or totalized guruism, the cloning of the guru that's expected from everyone, along with paranoid guruism and megalomanic guruism, all of this operating in ways that I've begun to suggest. Then there is a second expectation of an apocalyptic event or series of events that would destroy the world in the service of renewal. And that was Armageddon. It was, that's a Christian idea, but also there were uh, Hindu and Buddhist ideas of the end of the world or the gradual destruction of the world or the gradual destruction of morality in the world, which Asahara and Om also embraced. Another characteristic is an ideology of killing to heal, of altruistic murder, as I've described in relation to the concept of Poa, and this in turn becomes related to forcing the end. It's a kind of activist Armageddon that such people are seeking. And this also is related to a relentless impulse toward purifying the world. The whole world is seen as defiled, and one seeks to purify it. Uh, you can never kill or seek to kill large numbers of people, I believe, except under a claim of virtue. And that's what such groups have. But there must be such hatred for the world as so hopelessly defiled that it must be destroyed in the name of renewal, in the name of creating a pure new world. Another characteristic is the lure of ultimate weapons that I've just mentioned. The particular kind of megalomanic guru who is drawn to ultimate weapons and can bring to them this kind of action prophecy, as I've termed it, which really means not only prophesizing the end of the world, but taking action to bring about that prophecy because it is so central to, uh, to one's vision. And in order to do that, it requires a psychological state of psychic numbing, as I call it, and a state of aggressive numbing in which one doesn't feel any compassion for those outside of oneself. One may ignore or kill people without compassion, because one is bound up in one's own inner life and removed from these others, and one is acting under a claim of ultimate purity and ultimate virtue. And incidentally, that's, it can even be heroic in their own eyes, and it's very similar to what Heinrich Himmler, the uh, Nazi uh, leader, did when he called together SS leaders and congratulated them on their extraordinary achievement in killing so many Jews, and he spoke of how difficult it is to see a hundred corpses side by side, five hundred or a thousand. In other words, killing others becomes a noble ordeal that one achieves success in carrying out. And that was uh, a version of what Om Shinrikyo expressed. And then finally, there is an extreme technocratic aspect to all this. Uh, Asahara was very fascinated by science. He said that a religion which can't be proven by science is a fraud. Of course, he embraced science only insofar as it seemed to fit with his religious visions, but it's part of what I call a sacred science, which totalistic movements seem to embrace. Nowadays, in a scientific age, it isn't enough for ideas and visions to be sacred, one has to connect them with scientific truth. Spiritual truth and scientific truth, it is claimed, then, then go hand in hand. All of this, of course, uh, depends upon a claim on the part of the guru and the leaders of a cult of what I call the ownership of death. They own death and own life because of their ultimate virtue and because of their rooting out all defilement in the world. And at the same time, it is a process of survival. It isn't just that the world is being destroyed, it's that the world is being destroyed and an elite vanguard, 
in this case of Om Shinrikyo, guru and disciples, will alone survive and remake the world. So it is a statement of survival, uh, and that's a very important aspect of it. Well, let me um, finally come back to America and say something about parallels, not exact uh, replicas of Aum Shinrikyo. We haven't had those, fortunately, in the United States, but we have had certain parallels. Even the Charles Manson cult uh, with over 10 murders in 1969, we think of Manson and the cult retrospectively as a criminal gang, and they were that, but they were also a messianic, apocalyptic group which tried to force the end in the terminology I've been using by creating a race war. And that's why uh, Manson had his disciples write in blood on the walls of uh, the Polanski mansion where some of the murders took place, such things as black pigs, death to pigs, and so on, in order to create the illusion that blacks had done this, which would uh, enrage whites and create a race war, uh, which the blacks would eventually uh, triumph in and then call Manson out to be their great leader. I mean, the, the process is near psychotic, the vision is near psychotic, and it's reminiscent of Asahara's vision of creating uh, World War III and Armageddon. But it was a messianic vision of what might be called forcing the end. Uh, Jim Jones and the People's Temple and their catastrophe in Guyana in 1978, in which 922 people either committed suicide or were killed. It turned out as many as half of them were probably killed. Um, and that's ironic because um, Jim Jones started out as uh, a, a great uh, supporter of blacks and of racial harmony. And in the end, it was whites killing blacks because the whites had the medical talents and much of the killing was done by injection of a cyanide material. Uh, but the parallel is the mixture here of suicide and murder, a kind of end of the world process, forcing the end of a small environment, but was in a way totalistic and one could say near genocidal. In the case of Jim Jones, as in the case of Manson, there was no idea then, just a few decades ago, of these cultic groups obtaining the weapons. They saw themselves as victimized by the weapons. And for instance, Jim Jones moved his cult several times to places that he thought were safer in uh, a nuclear war. And that was a period during which there was much preoccupation with nuclear danger in this country. It wasn't until recently in the 1980s and 90s that the idea of a cult itself obtaining the weapons and becoming the instigator of Armageddon could take place. And that is a process, and a, an unhealthy one to say the least, that has moved ahead through simply our living with the weapons over these decades. Uh, finally, the American radical right, which perhaps most closely resemble Asahara and Ohm uh, in American cultic groups, uh, when Timothy McVeigh uh, set off a fertilizer bomb in Oklahoma City in 1995, he wasn't just a lone terrorist, but saw himself as a man transfixed by a particular apocalyptic vision. You may remember that uh, he carried about with him a novel called The Turner Diaries. He sold it at gun shows. He revered it, was said to sleep with it under his pillow. And what that novel projects is a great bloody revolution in this country created by noble members of the so-called white race. And they succeed in this revolution, which is finally achieved through nuclear holocaust. And success means total annihilation of all non-whites, all Jews, and all non-whites in the United States first, and then throughout the world. So this is a murderous, world-ending, apocalyptic vision in our own country. And while there was no guru uh, who was the equivalent of Asahara, it turns out that the Turner Diaries suggest a guru in the wings after all when they indicate toward the end of that volume that Adolf Hitler is the inspiration for this set of ideas and for this uh, revolutionary achievement. 
one can say that such groups represent a dark underside to our own society, but they are part of our society. And finally, in a few closing remarks, uh, let me say that Om Shinrikyo uh, did something new, became really the first group in history to combine ultimate fanaticism with ultimate weapons in a project to destroy the world. But we can't assume that this could never happen again. Once this kind of model is out in the world, it can be in some way replicated. I see my whole study as a plea for awareness. I don't see it as an expression of despair because I believe that by confronting these issues, we take a stand, we uh, express a degree of hope. One has to be in this process very wary of anyone who claims omniscience. Camus said wisely, he who does not know everything cannot kill everything. So cultic violence and this kind of totalism is by no means our only path available to us, but our protean sensibilities can create alternative attitudes and actions, alternative sources of life power. And these require uh, not status quo rigidities, but continuous imaginative efforts to locate ourselves in a confusing world as beings who do not seek to become superhuman but rather to sustain our humanity. I'll close with uh, an expression that seems very appropriate for this kind of work by Gershon Sholem, the great student of Jewish mysticism, who wrote, the story is not ended, it has not yet become history, and the secret life it holds may break out tomorrow in you or in me. Thank you very much. And now you've heard me sound off. I'd like to hear some of your questions or comments. Yes. Yeah, uh, just two brief questions. Um, one is, have you noticed in your study, have you, have you noticed, is your sense that there's a growth of the number of cults over time, over, the, say, the last century? Um, that's the one question. The second question is, what is your expectation or your, or your gut feeling for when you look at the newspaper on January 1st, 2000? Do you have a sense that there's going to be a rash of cultish, of cult like events? Uh, those are hard and good questions. Uh, I don't expect, to answer the second one first, I don't expect a rash of immediate cultic experience or expression uh, on January 1st. Uh, there are a lot of confusions of what the turn of the millennium really is, what date, and um, the cultic expressions have been periodic and you know erratic, not tuned to any particular moment, so that a lot occurred in 1995, including Om Shinrikyo, uh, then some kind of lull, uh, still lots of cultic activity. One has the impression, it's very hard to compare numbers of cults or uh, power of cults now, say, with years before, with with decades ago, with centuries ago, certainly there is a f an effusion of cults and of cultic behavior. And I, I do think there is a worldwide tendency toward some kind of uh, apocalyptic violence, not always expressed, but thought about and embraced. So to that extent, I think there has been some increase. It does have something to do with the millennium but I don't see it necessarily taking over our world or leaving us uh, helpless before it. Yes? There's a lot of reports in the Japanese media recently about the resurgence of Om Shinrikyo. Yeah. Um, a lot of the people have joined even after March 95 when the cult had a lot of bad publicity. Well, what do you attribute that to? Um, the question is about the resurgence of Om Shinrikyo, and it is a troubling one. Um, let me start by saying the young people I interviewed had so powerful experiences in the cult that even though they understood that it had ended up with criminality and they sought to separate themselves from it, they still longed for the mystical experiences as, as they thought them, uh, that they had experienced and the ties to the guru they had known. So it had a great hold on people. It seems that there are different estimates of how many people now belong to Om Shinrikyo, perhaps about 2,000, but only a certain percentage of those actively. Um, 
they have renounced violence, but they still have been apparently up to some of their old ways in forcibly detaining people who wanted to leave. Uh, they still express loyalty to their guru, and some of them feel that Asahara was misunderstood because it's impossible for ordinary people to understand godlike human beings. But having said all that, they don't in their present state seem to uh, present a threat to anyone or to Japan, yet at the same time it's troubling that after these revelations of criminal violence that so many Japanese, perhaps particularly young Japanese, would still want to be part of this. And that speaks, I think, of the depth of alienation of young people in Japanese society. Uh, we forget that Japan, which has been a country of very great achievements, has also been a country in the modern era since the Meiji Restoration of the late 19th century of great confusion. And I take up the whole issue of the Japanese origins of Ohm, uh, including a, a strong emphasis on confusions following upon World War II, both the humiliation of defeat and the inability to confront their own atrocities in World War II, which were very extensive and covered over for many years. Uh, but that's the, I think that's as fair a statement as I can make about the situation right now with Ohm Shinrikyo. Yes? Internet makes it the, the capabilities of cult groups to reach other people that think they were really more um, readily available. Do you have a crystal ball to predict about where the that's going to end? Yeah. Yeah. The question of those that are here is about the role of the Internet in being able to disseminate information, cultic information, and do I have a crystal ball about it? Well, I don't have any crystal ball about anything, I fear, but uh, of course you're right, the Internet is enormously important because it makes dissemination of all kinds of information more or less instantaneous. One could think of another group, I don't know whether they should be called a cult or not, Falun Gong, the Chinese group, which is of extraordinary numbers, not 30,000 or so as uh, there were Japanese members of Aum Shinrikyo, but in the millions of Falun Gong in China, and they've really disseminated uh, their materials very intensely on the internet worldwide, and that has much to do with their numbers. Uh, the radical right has used the internet very extensively in this country, and there are, I think, psychological connections between the use of the internet by the radical right, neo-Nazi movements, and some of the violence in high schools over the past year or so where some high school students have found models and they looked like junior versions of the radical right in the way that they brought guns into school and generally uh, in their demeanor. So yes, the internet uh, has danger in this kind of dissemination and it may be that we haven't yet caught up with our way, ways of dealing with the internet and ways of dealing with what the internet can disseminate. Again, the Internet can disseminate alternatives to cults as well, and the Internet has helped disseminate uh, some information that has helped people avoid cultic involvements. So I think one has to see a mixed picture with the Internet still a very active form of expression for many cultic movements. Yes? Dr. Lipton, um, I, it fascinates me, and, and I find myself um, wondering, I mean, I hear what you're saying, and intellectually, that's fine, but I, it just it fascinates me, the appeal of this uh, apocalyptic vision and, um, you know, destroying the world to save it, um, and particularly the appeal to those who get, who go with it, who, I'm, I was going to say, get sucked into this. Um, it, really, I think your question is about yeah. the sources of appeal of such an extreme vision. And I think I can partly explain that by putting it this way. The young disciples who came into the cult, and sometimes not so young disciples, didn't do so with an idea of destroying the world. They were spiritual seekers who were looking for some belief system and some spiritual meaning in their lives. Uh, the extreme totalistic guruism, as I tried to explain, really put them under the power of the guru, and he did have a vision of destroying the world. 
the average disciple didn't even know about the stockpiling of weapons until their use or attempted use, but the average disciple also had to fend off certain little and not so little indications that things weren't so well in the cult and that there were evidences of evil or violent behavior within the group. Uh, they were drawn, however, to the idea of the end of the world and to the idea of the world being deeply defiled. That plus their absolute attachment to the guru could take them over the hump, so to speak, into some kind of collusion in a vision of destroying the world. It has to do with um, overall confusions in our time, a search for spiritual meaning, and a very extreme quest for that meaning that in some minds isn't satisfied by less extreme kinds of expression. Yes? Um, do you see your model as somewhat applicable to individuals as well as groups? I, I'm thinking about the Unabomber who seemed concerned about the defiling of the world by technology and, you know, the question is, yes, uh, the question is about the ap applicability of this kind of model to certain individuals like the Unabomber. Well, yes, the Unabomber has certain parallels with Asahar and what I've said. Um, he did see the world as very defiled, and he did want to create a kind of renewal through violence, or as it's been put, regeneration through violence. And another similarity was, in his case particularly, the capacity to function at a very high intellectual level, that is to plan the bombings, to carry them out, to evade the FBI for years uh, while doing this, and all this required a certain kind of cleverness and intelligence. Uh, and he certainly was paranoid and megalomanic in a way reminiscent of Asahara. So yes, the model can apply to certain individuals. Yes? Do you feel that the Chinese government is right to worry about Falun Gong, or are they just really a meditation spiritual well, organization? Well, the question about Falun Gong and whether they're just a meditation group or the Chinese government is right to worry about them, um, I don't know enough about them. I'm not sure anybody really does to make a reasonable judgment. Um, I, I don't think the Chinese government is justified in doing what they're doing because it's, it's really suppression of human beings. Uh, but um, Falun Gong may be primarily a meditation group using really ancient Chinese spiritual exercises, but there seems to be some apocalyptic dimension to it. And that was given indication by an interview that uh, their leader, Lee, had with Time magazine in which he said that he sees uh, the problem of the world uh, created by evil aliens who are trying to steal from us our most precious property, the human body. And much of Falun Gong has to do with bodily exercises and focus on the body. And this kind of imagery suggested that he was fighting some kind of apocalyptic demons. But that doesn't mean that uh, this is a destructive cult or it's a violent group. I just don't know. Uh, it certainly focuses mainly on spiritual and bodily exercises and probably has some apocalyptic dimension that give it some of its power. Yes? Members of this cult as being the ones in search for spiritual meaning. And yet in the beginning of, our, of, your, of your talk, you mentioned uh, uh, sexual and economic exploitation. The people you spoke to, especially the younger members of this cult, how did they reconcile both uh, the search for meaning versus what they experienced in the cult? Uh, the question is about how I reconcile the quest for meaning with sexual and economic exploitation of uh, people, ordinary people in the cult from above. Well, Asahara followed certain tantric Buddhist practices of sexually initiating certain female disciples. That's not unusual in many different cults uh, for a guru to attempt to do it to carry through. And this was put forward as a kind of form of transmitting sacred energy. Uh, also, people were expected economically to give all of their life savings, and they did, to the cult and really to extract as much as possible of family uh, holdings so that the cult became extraordinarily rich and they also had various businesses and sold things and were as much of a, a commercial group as they were a spiritual group. Uh, this kind of combination of sexual and exploitation is 
not unusual uh, and it isn't necessarily experienced through a great deal of it as exploitation. That is, uh, I interviewed one woman who didn't have sexual relations with Asahara, but she seemed to envy those women who did and was very drawn to him and even had orgiastic experiences just thinking of him. And she couldn't condemn his sexual activities with other disciples because she thought it was in the service of spiritual attainment and transfer of spiritual energies. So these are forms of sexual and economic exploitation, but might not be experienced as such in the process. Yes? Um, I was curious. It seems like um, you, you alluded to after the uh, cultish leader um, kind of wages this apocalyptic campaign and, and kills people that after the fact sometimes they're, you discover kind of their psychotic childhood or their racist tendencies or their, you know, kind of negative, psychologically disturbed, um, pathological tendencies. Um, do you think that that, that is always, in, in your studies of psychology, do you think that that is always the case? It seems like um, you kind of made an allusion to um, the fact that um, this particular leader looked at, it didn't emphasize death, but emphasized renewal, and that that was significant. Um, so do all of, the, all of the people that you've studied have kind of these psychologically disturbed childhood, or is in well, some cases, is, is it completely I, normal? I think, the, was... I think the question really has to do with um, how disturbed in general these gurus are or have to be, and how much some kind of disturbed childhood contributes to that adult behavior. What I said was that a, a number of these gurus, and certainly Asahara, are on kind of the edge of paranoia and paranoid psychosis. He functioned in a paranoid way all through his relatively successful uh, control of his cult. Th that balance breaks down when he ceases to really uh, achieve the full loyalty of his disciples and as soon as disciples leave a guru he may break down and when Asahara was imprisoned there's a process I call deguruization they, they ceased of course the police and others ceased treating him as a guru and then in court some of his closest disciples condemned him as a false guru and then he seemed to fall apart more so uh, certain gurus are on the edge between simple paranoia where you can function and paranoid schizophrenia or paranoid psychosis where you break down and that breakdown tends to follow upon loss of control of one's environment and over one's disciples particularly. Certainly one's childhood has a lot to do with that behavior and that's why I both recounted some details of Asahara's childhood but also said that we delude ourselves if we think we can look exactly at a childhood and say exactly what an adult will do in relation to that childhood. I think if you work from a theory of the self, the self is a constantly moving and self-transforming entity and it's never simply a one-to-one -one product of something in childhood. So childhood is very important but can't totally explain adult behavior. Yes? So, drawing from your analysis, what is to be done? What, I know you're not a policymaker, but what does the country do, what does society do to curb that's a fair enough question, what is to be done. Uh, there's no easy answer to what is to be done because we function in a democratic society and uh, we can really um, take action, take legal action against people only when they break the law. But one has to be at least knowledgeable about some of these cultic patterns, about um, certain kinds of theology of the end of the world and of the activism or degree of pressure to carry through that theology, that end of the world theology, or, or what I called an activist Armageddonist or activist guru. And sometimes one has to take forcible police action where they do break laws, and one wants to be as knowledgeable as possible about them. Uh, I think it has, there's been some knowledge gained and there have been certain negotiations in recent uh, 
year or two with right-wing groups so that they've ended a couple of standoffs short of violence in a way that they tragically failed to do at Waco, where the government made a, a vast mistake in attacking uh, a group and, in a way, carrying out their, uh, leading them to see carried out before them their fantasies of Armageddon. More basically, these groups tend to develop and to develop destructively in times of great social change and social confusion and chaos. So the more we're able to distribute the benefits of society in some reasonable way and therefore give people some sense of potential achievement or meaning in their lives, the less these groups will threaten us. That's a large issue, but you see that kind of uh, issue uh, as important in terms of many of those enlisted for the radical right and the violent right who are um, farmers who've lost their farms or people who have lost any sense of significance in their lives in various ways. So those are some of my thoughts about your question without being a full answer at all. Yes. Dr. Lifton, perhaps a fantasy question. Um, if if we were to um, eliminate or really, el el let's say eliminate nuclear, our, nu our nuclear uh, arsenal, what do you imagine the impact would be um, in terms of the cults and the terrorists and what might uh, contribute to their, um, to their appeal? <clears throat> uh, well, if we were to eliminate all of our nuclear stockpiles, that's a beautiful fantasy. I'm with you. Uh, I don't think it would eliminate these cultic patterns I described completely, but I do think it would diminish many of them because the very existence of nuclear weapons in the world threatens the end of everything. And you know, the whole idea of fundamentalism, uh, it's a whole religious movement that began in the early 20th century where there was a fear of loss of fundamentals and we we all fear the loss of fundamentals in all of our lives I think that uh, with the absence of nuclear weapons there would be much less apocalyptic vision much less apocalyptic fantasy nowadays almost all world-ending fantasy has to connect with some vision of nuclear holocaust. That's true for almost any cult that has such theology or fantasy, so that it would all be diminished but not eliminated, but I think more rendered more manageable by the absence of nuclear and other ultimate weapons. Yes? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, the ten subjects you, uh, you interviewed? Was there any commonality? We know a lot of them. Many of the higher-ranking ones were from good universities. That's well-known. Well, known. well what uh, did you find, conclude from the ten. Um, among the ten former members whom I interviewed, they were mostly intelligent young people, mostly graduates of universities. Some uh, had done graduate work, yet they were only. Some people compared them to the best and the brightest. Uh, of Japan, as the phrase developed in this country. I don't think they were quite the best and the brightest. They were well-educated, but in a way half-educated people. Uh, and they were seekers. They, they were in some ways uh, adrift and uncertain about what to do with their lives. They were looking for a guru in many cases. They tended to have in common certain broad characteristics, but I wouldn't make this an absolute profile. And these characteristics were deep alienation from society, a kind of spiritual hunger, a sense of considerable dependency, which could be a longing for a messiah or a guru, uh, and therefore a great vulnerability to this kind of cultic movement. If I could follow up on that. Uh, I remember right after the attack, I was living in Japan, and they had some, one of the American networks immediately had some expert on TV, and he was saying, that this was uh, connected to the loss of the emperor, and you know he was the godlike uh, figure before then. And uh, Japanese, you said they were seeking some dependency. And do you well, agree with that assessment from that, that fellow? Uh, there are many part truths that one can say, uh, 
And, uh, you know, in, in my book, I, I call it destroying the world to save it because that was the image put forward by the cult. But I also try to take up a whole background study of the many sided forces that go into the creation of a cult like this. And I emphasize that it was not solely by any means a Japanese phenomenon. You heard me talk about some American groups even briefly. And it had to have a Japanese expression. And of course, it's related to emperor worship, but not in a simplistic way. Uh, and there are certain Japanese uh, traditional expressions, even of Zen Buddhism and of other forms of Buddhism that were in some ways parallel to Om Shinrikyo, but it also drew from Tibetan Buddhism and other sources. Nor is it only Japanese in that other groups elsewhere are quite capable and have expressed such apocalyptic longings and apocalyptic uh, violence or impulse toward violence. So we should both think about its Japanese origins, but complexly on the one hand, and see it as not exclusively Japanese on the other. Okay, should this be the last question? Japanese, on the other hand, have we seen any other such developments on the other, say, in Sweden or such countries? Or I, I didn't speak up and hear the question. Since it's not exclusively Japanese phenomenon, have right. we seen in other countries like Sweden or other countries where oh. we are not supposed to expect such developments, or on the left, extreme left? Uh, the question is, if it's not exclusively Japanese, have we seen any such developments elsewhere, really, in this country or in Europe? Um, well, there haven't been yet. I've indicated some with a few parallels. So Om Shinrikyo is a kind of a pi pioneering group. They're the first of a kind. Remember, combining uh, activist Armageddon, forcing the end of the world in their ideas with the weaponry with which it's possible to do that. That's a new model. Uh, it hasn't yet been replicated, but it could readily be because replicated because we fight. Uh, in the radical right in this country, there was a similar, or has been and still is, a similar impulse. But I say that the guru is in the text of uh, the Turner Diaries. So the text becomes the guru. But there also could develop a more compelling guru who fortunately has not yet emerged from the radical right. No, there hasn't been uh, an exact replica of Om Shinrikyo, but there have been many parallels. Okay, thanks very much for your questions and for coming tonight. Robert Lifton is a member of the American Psychiatric Association. His other books include The Atomic Bomb, Cults in Our Midst, and The Nazi Doctors. Henry Holden Company publishes his most recent book, Destroying the World to Save It.